Hi guys, uh, welcome to another Tuesday Tune. We haven't done one of these for quite a while now. Um, today's topic uh, is going to be about electronic suspension. Uh, this is something that seems to have been a long time coming. It's been tried a few times over the years uh, with varying degrees of success. So let's have a bit of a dig into that and uh, see what some of the advantages, disadvantages, limitations and opportunities of electronic suspension are. So in order to have any real insights into uh, electronically controlled suspension, we have to define the various types. So we understand when we're talking about active suspension, um, are we really talking about fully active suspension like in the Williams Formula One car from the early 90s uh, or the Bose car, uh, which used uh, electromagnetic motors to actually lift and lower the car. Uh, Mercedes has a system like this uh, in some of their vehicles. That is a fully active system where it can actually lift the vehicle, it can move the wheels out of the way of obstacles actively. Second type is semi-active. So this uses uh, real-time, high-speed, event-by-event damping control that is electronically controlled. What that means is that bump-by-bump bump or corner-by-corner, corner, it's adjusting all the time. Uh, that is a true semi-active system or reactive system, as it were. The third option, which is what we most commonly see with uh, you know, electronic suspension, is a mode selector of some form. That basically means that you have multiple mechanically controlled modes that the electronic system switches between. So with these three in mind, we're going to have a quick look into uh, what the options currently on the mountain bike market are. So as some of you are no doubt aware, uh, RockShox recently released their flight attendance system, which has come uh, a few years after Fox's live valve. Uh, it does things in a little bit different of a manner. Uh, the live valve system is basically a lockout that flicks on and off very quickly, but when it is in the locked out mode, it is mecha mechanically and hydraulically locked out. Flight attendant does things in a slightly different manner where it has increments of adjustment, um, or essentially an infinite range of adjustment uh, because it is controlling the low speed compression adjustment. The advantage of uh, flight attendant is that it can adjust to any point in the low speed adjuster's range, plus any other options that the mode selector can control. The disadvantage is that it has to move quite a bit more slowly. Both the flight attendant system and live valve are doing something fairly fundamentally similar, which is that they are more or less mode selectors. They're not able to adjust the suspension uh, in fine increments. They're not able to vary the damping in fine increments. Uh, at high speed. One does things at high speed, the other one does it in fine increments. Neither of them do both at once. I'll get into the reasons for that, speculative reasons for that, shortly. First of all, let's have a look at uh, the fundamental differences between them. Um, first of all, flight attendant is what we call normally open. So that's a system that runs a valve where the default mode is that the valve is open. Live valve, by contrast, is normally closed. That means it is closed unless it has a reason to be open. Versus this open unless it has a reason to be closed. What are the differences here? The difference is that a normally open system is going to behave much like your conventional bike nearly all the time unless you need it to be firm up. Unless you need it to firm up for pedaling. The normally closed system that light valve uses uh, is typically locked out. Unless it sees that, oh wait, there's a bump, we need to open up. Um, once it's in that open mode, then it will behave much like a conventional bike as well. The transition between the two uh, with flight attendant is relatively slow. Their sensors sample much more slowly, uh, about 200 hertz versus uh, live valve at uh, 1000 hertz. So they're uh, one fifth the sample rate, but they don't need to sample as quickly with, um, with flight attendant because they're not trying to adjust they're not having to pull the shock out of locked out mode so quickly. Because its default state is in the normally open mode, um, and because you're not having to rip the thing out of lockout, you know, at some absurdly high speed, um, you don't have such a short time to do things in, um, that's given RockShox the ability to make finer adjustments. It is worth commenting at this point that both of these systems uh, flight attendant and it's normally open system and live valve and it's normally closed system are in some sense the equivalent of having a little electronic gnome sitting in your bottle cage flicking your dials for you. It's essentially what they're achieving. As I mentioned before, neither of them is making 
high resolution, fine increment changes at high speed. Live valve is moving at high speed, flight attendant is moving at, uh, at fine increments. Let's have a look at some of the limitations of electronically controlled suspension as it pertains to mountain bikes. The first one, uh, and the biggest one really, is power. Uh, we only have a certain amount of weight that we can really tolerate on a mountain bike. Um, so by the time you have a battery pack and a motor system that is powerful enough uh, for a fully active system that can actually lift a bicycle and the rider, uh, we're looking at a tremendous amount of power. To be able to do this at high speed, we'd be looking at something that draws about as much power as an electromagnetic dyno does. Uh, and having tripped the breaker board a few times in our workshop, I can tell you that's a lot more power than a battery pack typically contains on a bike. Even with semi-active systems uh, and mode selection systems, we still have the issue of power. Battery, battery density, uh, energy density, and the power required by either valves or motors is quite significant. Uh, the more power that is required, or the more adjustment that is required, the more power is required. The more power is required, the bigger the battery and the motor need to be. The bigger the battery and the motor get, the bigger the strain on the rider and the bigger the compromise in terms of weight. This is the fundamental reason I believe, not being privy to design decisions of uh, Fox or RockShox, this is the reason I believe that uh, the systems that we see primarily are the way that they are. If power was no issue, yes, we could build fully active suspension. Unfortunately, storing enough power on the bike, storing enough energy on the bike in the form of the battery and having a motor that's big enough, that's not very likely to happen. If we get to the point where we can somehow have a uh, miniature nuclear reactor on board our mountain bikes, uh, then we might have fully active suspension, but at that point we would also have hog bikes, uh, possibly nuclear meltdowns. Second limitation, moving things under load. So when we go to a semi-active system, uh, like the flight attendant or live valve, what that's really doing is adjusting a valve or opening a valve, uh, in the case of live valve, which is just a binary system, it's either open or closed, that has to be done under load, while the system is under high pressure. Um, in order for it to be able to respond very quickly, it needs to be able to respond regardless of what the pressure within the, the system is. So the oil pressure, which is what provides your damping force, will put a significant amount of load on anything that is trying to move. Designing something that, such that it uses a minimal amount of power and can move adequately under load and isn't pushed around by the pressures inside the fork of the shock very difficult to do. The third one, and probably the big one, is response time. So even if we had unlimited power and we could move freely under load uh, with the valve or a fully active suspension system, a really big one is response time. And this is the fundamental reason, I believe, why we're not seeing electronically controlled suspension on uh, Baja trophy trucks and off-road vehicles in general. We're seeing it a little bit um, on the side-by-sides. Fox have a live valve uh, on the Polaris side-by-sides. Um, but in general, we're not seeing it on serious off-road uh, vehicles like motorbikes. We're not seeing it on motocross bikes. We're not seeing it on uh, desert rally stuff, I don't believe. Could be wrong. Yeah, feel free to correct me if I'm uh, mistaken on that. But the fundamental reason for that is response time. Fox live valve claims to respond in three milliseconds. So it's three one thousandths of a second, uh, for those of you who speak Imperial. Um, that is very fast. So I've been talking for several minutes now. Live valve could have flicked back and forth probably 20,000 times by now and drained the battery. The response time basically dictates how far the vehicle or the wheel has moved um, horizontally across the ground um, in the time that the valve has been able to adjust or open. And that is, in some regards, an advantage of the flight attendant system compared to live valve. The response time doesn't really matter if the things are open all the time. Uh, putting the, the shock in the locked out mode or the climb mode, whatever it may be, when you're pedaling, the difference between that taking three milliseconds and 500 milliseconds, half a second, is pretty insignificant. So when you're going from the open mode to the locked mode, the response time is less critical. I think that was a smart design decision on RockShox's part. So where response time becomes particularly critical uh, with off-road applications is uh, with regard to how far the wheel actually moves in the time that it takes to respond. Mountain bikes don't move that quickly, but they can move quickly enough. 
So if we take Fox's uh, three millisecond response time, that's their claim response time, I haven't measured it. I'll take them at their word because I don't think they make things like that up. Um, if we take that as an example of something that is very fast, um, then let's have a look at how far the wheel will actually move in that time. So if we're moving at five meters a second, uh, which is 18 kilometers an hour, or uh, 90 and 1 16th furlongs per sundial radian, um, in three milliseconds at that speed, you have traveled 15 millimeters. 15 millimeters, uh, that would basically be your X response here. So the distance that the wheel has moved there. But that also generates a Y response, right? So the Y response is how far the wheel has had to be shifted vertically uh, to lift up over a bump. Obviously this is drawn with like, what is realistically an extremely large step relative to the, uh, the wheel diameter, um, just to sort of highlight it. But this is still a relatively small percentage of the wheel's diameter as sketched here. If we bump that speed up, our horizontal speed, so that's our VX, we bump that up to 10 meters a second. That is 36 kilometers an hour. Uh, that is a fairly common speed that a mountain bike would be traveling on a descent. Um, within that three milliseconds, we've now traveled 30 millimeters, right? So this X response distance obviously gets bigger in direct proportion to the speed that we're traveling at. If we look at uh, motorized vehicles like, uh, say, a motocross bike traveling at 72 kilometers an hour, 20 meters a second, uh, that is 360 and 1 one hundredth furlongs per sundial radian, uh, for those of you still using the Imperial system, uh, in that time, you will have traveled 60 millimeters horizontally and whatever distance vertically is determined by the, the size of the actual step or bump that you're encountering. In the space of 60 millimeters, um, we've covered actually a significant fraction of the wheel's radius, right? Within that 60 mil, um, that's basically how far the wheel has traveled without any response from the suspension. And that's why um, it's better in the RockShox uh, system, I believe, that they start with the, uh, the system in the normally open mode. Now there is a bit of a caveat to that. The, the Fox system will stay open for a little while. It doesn't lock again after each bump. So it stays open for a predetermined amount of time after it's encountered a first bump. So if you're moving continuously through a rough section, uh, you still have the suspension in its open state. Now it's worth considering though, with both flight attendant and live valve, and at this stage probably what we are expecting to see from uh, Olin's fairly shortly. What we've seen so far have been mode selection systems, essentially. Um, they're happening, in the case of live valve, it's a binary system. With flight attendant, it is uh, more incremental, but it's still essentially the equivalent of a $2,000 automatic lockout. It's not quite that. It's more than that in the case of flight attendant, but it's not too far from that. It's worth noting that uh, when it's in the open mode, or in any given mode really, it isn't fundamentally different from a purely mechanical damper. It isn't entirely different. It doesn't do anything different once, like when that valve is not actually opening and closing. So because it doesn't fundamentally uh, alter the mechanism by which damping is generated or the mechanism by which uh, the spring force is generated or the friction or anything like that, isn't really a big deviation from what we currently have. It still has many of the same compromises. In fact, all the same compromises as uh, existing forks, with the exception that now it can be firmer if it needs to be um, for pedaling. Uh, which to some riders who are only focused on the descent, gravity oriented riders, you could run a quick calculation to see whether this is likely to be worthwhile for you. Here's a calculation for you. If you ride 100 times a year, right, it's twice a week roughly, you flick your lockout four times a ride. So it's 400 lockout flicks per year. That's two to locked out, two to unlocked. Uh, takes you, let's say 10 seconds flicky lockout lever. Don't know why it would take you that long, but I don't know. Maybe you forgot where it was. That gives you a total per ride of uh, 40 seconds spent flicking your lockout. Over the course of that year, that's 2.22 uh, hours flicking lockouts. And it's actually a reasonable amount of time when you think about it. For an additional 2,000 US dollars, to save you two hours of flicking your lockout, 
would you pay that? So that basically means that you value the labor of your uh, electronic gnome at uh, 900 US dollars an hour. For some people, the answer actually is yes. If you want the latest and greatest, coolest thing, and you want something that is very adaptive in terms of its mode selection, um, I think both of these systems have considerable merit. With that said, whether that's applicable to you as an individual writer is really up to you to decide. For myself, it's not enough of a game changer in either case to justify the weight and the cost. It doesn't fundamentally improve the things that I feel can most be improved. Uh, but for some writers, it really, it really will address uh, certain concerns about compromises between pedaling efficiency and uh, descending performance. And I think it does open up some opportunities to design bikes around these systems that are much more capable, uh, longer travel bikes, right? Like there's, if your bike climbs the same, why not have a longer travel bike? What's the disadvantage? You know, maybe you prefer the snappier feeling of uh, stiffer spring rates, but you know, that's, uh, that's not everyone's cup of tea. Is there a way that we can now have a, a downhill bike that literally goes uphill like a cross country bike? Maybe. Um, it's certainly closer than it is with a purely mechanical system, um, simply because the lockout engagement is significantly faster. It doesn't involve you doing anything. The bike is just in that mode when it needs to be. Obviously, there's still certain disadvantages to very long travel bikes, like downhill bikes, even when descending or on, you know, particularly on moderate terrain. Um, soft spring rates get a bit soggy feeling. I guess the, the big question though, is it really a game changer? No, it's not. Um, electronic suspension, as it currently stands, it's another incremental improvement. It's a very expensive one, um, but I think there's gonna be a number of people out there that are willing to pay it. With that said, um, Live Valve's been around for a little while now. Hasn't massively taken off. I don't know what the sales figures are, but we've uh, seen very few of them. Flight Attendant, fortunately, has made things, uh, has retained serviceability uh, of all the units to the same degree as a standard fork and shock, and that's a big benefit. And importantly, it doesn't appear to need the same degree of integration with the frame that Live Valve does. So I think we'll see wider spread adoption of it than we did with Live Valve. With that said, no doubt Fox are working on some repost to this. Uh, and I would expect to see something pretty cool from them uh, in the next year or two, really. Um, we've certainly seen enough, uh, enough of their patents um, to know for sure that they are working on things like that. Uh, thanks to Dan at Wheelbased uh, for digging a lot of that stuff up. There's many rumors, some of them not really rumors, uh, that Owens will soon have something to market. Owens has been making electronically controlled suspension for 30 years now. Uh, so they've been doing it a very long time. They know what they're doing. I'd be interested to see what they come up with. Anyway, that's enough of uh, my rambling. And uh, hopefully there's something interesting or thought-provoking in there. And uh, we'll see you next time.